Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Assembly of God. Let's stand together on a Sunday morning, rainy Sunday morning here in Springfield, New Jersey. But on the inside, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to move greatly. So God bless you as you lift your voice to Jesus this morning. Let's sing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yes, God. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Sing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yes, Lord. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Sing, people. From every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. Sing, we worship, we worship. Good morning and welcome to Calvary. I wonder if you came into God's house this morning and said, I'm so discouraged and weary. I know I'm doing the right thing. I'm choosing to be obedient to God's spirit. That's a way of faith. But as I plant these seeds, all I see is this the barren ground. And I'm just tired and done with it. Oh, don't. God tells us in Galatians 6, don't be weary in well-doing. Because those seeds you planted of obedient faith to God's Spirit will absolutely bring a harvest in days to come. And he says, and if we turn away and we instead just sow to our own sinful nature, I'll do what I want and what everybody else is doing, Oh, he said that too will bring a harvest. Oh, not right away, but in days to come, a harvest of great loss. Be encouraged this morning. Put your trust and faith in God's changeless word. Be obedient to his spirit that dwells in you. Let's pray together. Father, we come into your house this morning. And you see our hearts, oh God. And this morning we choose that they are hearts of faith. Hearts that believe you, oh God. You said it's with our heart we believe unto righteousness. And so, Father, we choose to sow to righteousness today. And we, 
rejoice in you, O God, for all that is to come because you are a faithful and a changeless God. We lift our voice in praise this morning, Father, filled with joy and peace in believing, and we abound in hope. Because of the witness of your Holy Spirit within us, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sing, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe in you. just arise in faith just as sister B just prayed would you just declare over your hearts that I believe I believe in your goodness and your righteousness Lord God let that fuel Lord our desire to serve you our desire to go boldly out for you and obey you Lord God because we believe you Lord that your word is true. Would you give us the desire, Lord God, to live dead, to surrender our rights, to surrender our life, Lord God, for the kingdom, for the work, Lord God, that you called us to. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. We believe, oh Lord. Sing, I would give. I would give the world to tell your story. Cause I know that you called me. I know that you called me. I've lost myself for good within your promise. And I won't hide it. I won't hide it. Sing it again, I would give. And I would give the world to tell your story. Cause I know that you called me. I know that you called me. Thank you, Lord. I've lost myself for good within your promise. And I won't hide it. I won't hide it. Sing Jesus. Jesus, I believe in you. And I will. Such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful. Such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so
Jesus, you're faithful, your goodness and mercy. Follow us all the days of our lives. Sing this, how I How I Listen, how deep, how deep. Jesus. Would you thank him for his amazing love in your life? Give him glory. Thank him. And as you thank him, make sure you make that very personal. You say, he has a great love for you, for you as an individual, and that you would feel it individually. Father, we thank you for sending your son and for Jesus for loving us so much that while we can say you love us all, we also can say you love me. You love me. Each of us can say that. And so, Jesus, thank you for loving me with everything. I pray, Lord Jesus, today that I would be able to love you back in such great proportions of, Lord, the maximum I can give out of my life. And I pray your grace helps me to do that. Each of us, Lord, you loved us. May we love you. Jesus, you did your part. You gave yourself on the cross. Now may we give, Lord, what is proper and right, our lives back to you and tell the world about Jesus. So bless, we pray, Lord, this morning by your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit so we might realize fully how great your love is for us. Pour out your Spirit this morning. In the great name of Jesus, we then do pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, welcome on a... Uh, it's not a sunny day. Okay, on a rainy day to Calvary Assembly, take a moment, shake a hand, see if anybody's still wet from coming into the parking lot, and then uh, we move on from there. God bless you. Online, we welcome you. Glad you're with us this morning. We're always saving a seat for you in the sanctuary, though, so don't forget that. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Here, I heard it. I thought I did.
Amen. You may be seated. Hey, if you weren't with us last week, we preached a sermon entitled, God of Miracles, God of Mysteries. And you may want to look that over because it will take you through a rough valley and always take you to the mountaintop, the God of Miracles. Uh, we handed out the story of Greg Mundus, our AGWM leader, at least up till, I, I guess, this month or so. And, and he, a new man's moving in, but we're thankful for what Greg Mundus has done and his wife, Sandra, in the past, oh, decade at least, plus far more, a lifetime of missions. Anyway, their book was available. We gave it out to everybody in the congregation. If you did not get one, there's a limited number on the table in the back. They may already be gone, actually. Uh, but if you didn't get one, please try to grab one. Hear his testimony of how God brought him from death's door through the COVID experience and brought him back to continue to serve God. God of miracles, God of mysteries, that's for sure. Well, welcome to Calvary this morning. We we are blessed that you are here. Those online, we welcome you, and I want you to know we've saved seats for you. There's everybody in here said, I've got a seat waiting for you. So we're waiting for you to come and be part here. If you're a visitor this morning, we call you a guest, and we have a table that we ask you to go to after the service is over and to fill out a little form. We call it a connection card. That card comes to me, and at the same time, they want to give you a little gift packet to thank you for coming to Calvary, and this gives me opportunity to send you a text and to tell you how thankful we were you were here and send you a video about some follow-up and whatever else would bless you. And so uh, thanks for being with us this morning. Please stop by after the service, Guest Central, out in the foyer. Well, coming up, all sorts of things this week. The ladies get together on Friday night. They still have sign-up in the foyer. Uh, they start at 7 o'clock. There is child care, and there is some kind of food that night. So I'm encouraging you to be with them this coming Friday night, ladies. But signing up makes the whole preparation process from beginning to end so easy. The following morning, the guys are getting together. And guys, we've got our bacon breakfast. We don't sign up. We just show up. And so guys, just show up. We're looking for you uh, Saturday morning, 8.30. Come, get out of bed. Uh, wife, maybe you need to push him out of bed. Uh, don't get pushy, but push him out of bed. So I would encourage you to be here. In fact, hey, while you've got the, you know how it is. When tomorrow you're going to start a diet, you say to somebody today, hey, help me tomorrow on my diet. Then tomorrow you don't want to do your diet, but now they're telling you how to do it because you ask them. Well, maybe you should ask your wife to get you up and ready to go on Saturday morning for men's breakfast. And then, literally a week from this morning is our annual time where we invite all our students. We bring them up from our, our children's churches, and we bring all our teachers up, and we bring all the other students that are in the sanctuary, and we pray for them all for a brand new school year. And whether that's uh, in any level, whether that's homeschool or elementary, uh, even our toddlers, uh, you know, preschool, elementary, uh, through middle school, high school, college, university, whatever, we would invite them all up here to ask God to give them smart brains, smart brains to learn and smart brains to know between good and evil. So we want to pray for them. Make sure they're here next week. Then we go a couple Wednesday nights from now, and we're going to have our graduation or our annual graduation for Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries. Just kind of prepping you for that. We'd love for you to be here. Make sure your kids are here. Uh, we want to honor the teachers, the commanders for what they've done. Youth Retreat is coming up in just a couple weeks. Man, like I said, everything happens in September. The rest of the year, we do nothing. But the, in September, something happens. And so, uh, obviously, our youth are going off on a retreat. It's going to be good. Uh, it, it does have uh, just a, a great theme to it and all that goes with it, encouraging you to send your kids. And if you have not paid for their uh, retreat, there is going to be a special ability to pray, pay rather with, you can pray too, but pay with your uh, credit card back at the youth table afterwards. I guess they have an iPad set up or something like that. So you can get it done this morning rather than have to worry about it later or have a follow-up or all that kind of stuff. And then just one more thing before I, uh, before I kind of switch gears here. Uh, coming up in October, I want to remind you ladies. Now, I realize we've already got something going on this week, but unfortunately we have to start thinking about this early. In October will be our district-wide, our network-wide ladies meeting. Uh, they call it Seamless. 
and developing generations of women to find and follow Jesus. We're not registering this morning, but I want you to know next week there will be registration for that, but it's only for two weeks, and then it closes a couple weeks before the event even happens. And so we need you to sign up uh, starting next week, but put it on your agenda. At least write down the dates of the 14th that it's going to be a very special day. And ladies, we want you to go, and it's literally, this is one of the time, the few times that it's within just about 10 miles of our church, which is rare, very rare. So thank God for that. And finally, thank you for your giving. Thank you for your giving. Uh, at the end of the service, ushers will be at the door. Obviously, you can go to our website, calvaryassembly.church, and you can give there. And, or you can mail it in if you're online. Some people do that also. And so, but make sure that you give, because remember, giving is planting. If you don't plant, foolish is the farmer who stares at a field he never planted and expects a harvest. But wise is the farmer who simply patiently waits for what he has planted to bring forth a God-guaranteed harvest of 30, 60, 100-fold. God will take care of you as you walk in the ways of the Word. And one of those ways is your tithe. And one of those ways that would really bless you and open up doors just beyond you can understand is giving to missions. So those two I encourage you to do. Again, thank you. God bless you for your giving. Well, earlier this year, one of our own, we sent off to a month in Africa. And we were, we were thrilled to have her go and thrilled to have her have a heart for missions and maybe a, a future. And God seems to be opening those doors. Markella Quinn went to the Ivory Coast. I can't say it in French, but she went to the Ivory Coast. And so I say, oui, oui, that's all I can say, you know. Uh, and that's about it. But otherwise, um, we were thrilled to send her, and now God has opened the door for her to continue to go, and even uh, right now working on it. But while she was there, she met some very special Assemblies of God missionary friends. I want Mercola to come and introduce them. Good morning, church. Um, let me ask you guys a question. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you felt all alone? Maybe it was the first day of school or the first day of college or university. Maybe you just moved into a new neighborhood and you knew no one there. And in that moment, you felt like you were the only person in the world. And all you needed was just one friend to come alongside you to make you feel known and seen and loved. When I was in the Ivory Coast in February, I felt like that. It was a new country, a new place. I, I couldn't speak the language and I knew no one there. I felt so alone and to be honest, a little fearful. But I met two amazing people while I was out there who came alongside me and they were friends to me. They showed me the love, the kindness and the compassion of Jesus. And while I was there, they helped me get accustomed to the culture and to the country of Ivory Coast. We did ministry together, we shared food together, we played games together and laughed together. And so I am so blessed and honored that they are here today, this morning, to share their ministry and their heart for missions in Africa. So would you join me in welcoming Kevin and Mariah Thompson as they share. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. We are Mariah and Kevin Thompson. We are fully appointed Assembly of God missionaries to the Ivory Coast, West Africa. And today we are honored to be here with all of you and especially happy, happy to be with Mar Markella again. I got to tell you all that Markella represented Jersey well. <laughs> <laughs> Markella was so kind to everyone she met, whether she could communicate or not. She ate everything that was served to her with a smile. She was extremely humble and she worked so hard. This was one of the hardest months of church construction and outdoor outreach that I had ever done. And Markella really was a champ and she left a really good impression. So we're so honored to be amongst you, her friends and family. So Kevin and I are here. We're back in preparation for our next term in West Africa. And Kevin's gonna share with you a bit about what we'll be doing. Amen, thank you. So 
my mom absolutely loved Jesus. Does anyone in here love Jesus? Yeah. Amen. My mom absolutely loved Jesus, but at 12 years old, I did not. You see, at 12 years old, I began to use drugs, and I began to become an outright angry atheist. I hated the things of God. I hated the Bible. I absolutely despised Christians. I almost physically attacked every pastor I ever met in my life as a child, and I wanted nothing to do with my mom's Jesus. So for 12 years, I lived like this, in addiction, as an atheist, speaking against the things of God. And at 22 years old, I attempted suicide. After I attempted suicide, I ended up in the hospital where I met a chaplain. This chaplain gave me a book. It was called An Anchor for the Soul, and it explained Jesus to me in a way that was tangible, in a way that I could understand. It explained the things of the Bible, and I accepted Christ August of 2015 for the very first time. But I came to a crossroads. I finally believed the things in the Bible were true, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I went to someone who I thought could help. And he told me about the Teen Challenge program. Anybody in here familiar with Teen Challenge? Man. It was in Teen Challenge where I was discipled. You see, salvation got me in the door, but discipleship changed my life. And while I was being discipled, I learned of something called the Great Commission. You see, Jesus' words in Matthew 28 and verse 18, when I read it for the very first time, it was like Jesus was sitting right next to me. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. You see, there's an estimated 65% of the world today that lives in places that are known to harass Christians. Over 3 billion people estimated to not know Christ. And Jesus says in John 14 and 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And it was like Jesus was speaking those words directly to my spirit. And I said, Lord, who in their right mind would go to the Horn of Africa where it's 120 degrees at night for the chance to share Jesus? You see, if someone came to me today and said, if you give your life to Jesus right now and go to the mission field, you'll see a billion people come to Christ. Many of us would give everything right now. But I heard of Christians for the very first time in my life that were willing to give up all of their comfort in the United States for a chance to share the gospel. And I said, Lord, who would go? And I don't know if it was ignorance or obedience, but I said, here am I, Lord. Send me. I got nothing to offer. I got no college education. I got no formal education of any type. I don't know what I'm doing, but I hope that you will have me. And he called me, and he told me that I needed to prepare myself for a lifetime of ministry in Africa. And so as I began to do all the steps and all the processes in order to become a lifelong career missionary, he told me that I needed a wife, so I found one of those just after I got out of the Teen Challenge program. And for the past two years, that wonderful wife of mine and I have been living in Ivory Coast, West Africa, where they do speak French, oui, oui. <laughs> a land that is full of lostness, unfortunately. Over six million lost 33 unreached people groups speaking over 60 languages in one country. French is just the main one they have in common. But my wife and I, we work with a ministry called Africa Tabernacle Evangelism. It's an arm or an extension of Assemblies of God World Missions in that we partner with local believers to plant churches in hard and unreached locations in desolate places, in villages, places that are really far and difficult to get into. You see, our vision is to see a healthy church within walking distance of every person in Africa. It's a simple vision, but it's so profound. And it's something that we desire to do, to see churches planted within walking distance of every person in Africa. Could you imagine your life today 
without a local church? You see, as a Teen Challenge graduate, I knew what it meant to have a local body of believers to fellowship with. You see, in the local church, we have a place of fellowship, we have a place of unified worship, and a place of discipleship. And yet many places all over Africa do not have an adequate place to meet together. An estimated 25,000 fellowships across Africa do not have a place that they can meet together. They do not have adequate place that they can gather. Not a safe place. Maybe it's under the heat of the sun. Maybe it's under the shade of a tree. They just do not have a place that's free of distractions of an open-air meeting. And so my wife and I are able to partner with churches in the United States to provide a basic roof structure in these remote and hard-to-reach places, giving them a leg up as they begin to evangelize and plant churches in the nearby area. We're able to put up a structure that will hold roughly 300 people for only $8,500. I have a short video that's going to tell you more about our ministry. It's just two minutes long. If you could play that clip for me. with me, a healthy church within walking distance of every person in Africa. This is our vision, and by the work of the Holy Spirit, people are coming to Jesus and churches are being planted across the continent of Africa. But along with the growth of the church in Africa comes a need. For many African congregations, having a permanent church building to meet in is too costly due to their limited resources. Africa Tabernacle Evangelism began in 1991 in response to this need. Since then, Africa Tabernacle Evangelism has helped construct almost 3,500 buildings. Partnership is crucial. Africa Tabernacle Evangelism provides the basic framework and roof while the local church will then finish the walls and floor. Teams also come from the USA to work alongside our African brothers and sisters during the construction process. It's a beautiful display of partnership and unity for the glory of God. In fact, many churches even double in size within one week of a tabernacle being built. The African Assemblies of God has grown to over 83,000 local congregations, and as a result, there's a great need for tabernacles to be built. Financial support to purchase and ship building supplies is needed. Would you like to engage in this work that has such a great influence on a local community? Congregations are waiting for you. It is in working together with churches in Africa that we will have the most impact. Will you partner with us to provide building materials for a new church? Will you partner with our African brothers and sisters as they spread the gospel in their area? Will you be a kingdom builder? Together, we can change the face of Africa. Amen. Amen. It's a good video. Out of, these, out of these new churches that we're able to help construct with your partnership, we see disciples, we see pastors, we see leaders, children's workers, and we pray one day even missionaries that will come forth from these buildings that we're able to put up. And in the past two years that Mariah and I have lived in Ivory Coast, we've built 21 of these churches. Amen. We look to return next March to continue this work and this effort, and we hope to build 10 more churches in our first year back in Ivory Coast, but we can't do it alone. We ask you to join with us in prayer. We ask you to join with us in finances as you continue to give to Faith Promises, and if you would like to help support a building, there's room for that. But more than that, we see this as a friendship. We've come all the way from North Carolina to visit you at your home And we pray that you would be open to come and visit us at ours in West Africa, as Markella did. We'd love to have you. We'd love to host you. We'd love to show you around and minister together for the glory of God. We thank you so much for your time. Bless you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So, Calvary is definitely going to 
get involved in one of those. And uh, I know we've already actually, as a missions committee, talked about it because we kind of had a heads up on this was happening. So I will give you the exacts when that happens. But remember, continue to give towards missions. We will give, a, we'll give the Thompsons a, uh, a beautiful offering this morning. And we will take care of something here making it happen. So God bless you for that. God bless you for that. Missions. A, a, a church is healthy when they have a heart for missions. We are healthy. We want to be healthy. Let's continue to do that. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, Pastor Josh, I need you to come up. And um, Pastor, now that you're coming up, we need to talk a little bit about uh, our life groups coming up. And I'd like to highlight one. I'd like to highlight the mom's one. So Emily, are you around, available. Where's Emily? Yeah. Oh, here you are. <laughs> it's okay. Can the two of you just give us a quick update on, say, life groups, and specifically, we'll highlight the mom's one. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you probably saw on your way in this morning, there was a life group table. I know there's a lot of things we're emphasizing this morning, but I want you to know we have these sessions during the year where we say, sign up for a life group. Be part of a smaller group of believers in your local church. It's wonderful to come on a Sunday morning, but it's easy to kind of get lost in the crowd. When we can gather in, in homes and different places around this county during the week, that's a group of accountability where you can pray together. And you can, and you can believe together. Okay, now I have the mic here. Um, and so I just, I just hope that you on your way out will, will sign up at the life group table. If you have any questions, we'll be standing there. And uh, as Pastor mentioned, there are different types of life groups there. One is just for moms, uh, one is for young adults, and, and there's some others there as well. But I hope that you will, your heart will be stirred to be part of that. Um, I know, Emily, you're also going to uh, speak about uh, the ladies' event that's coming up this, this um, Friday. And just kind of give the ladies a little bit of a oomph about why they should attend and what, it would be, what would be the reason why they should come. Thank you. I was, uh, um, I don't know about you, but did you sense God's presence when you were here during worship? You know, you and I have God's presence with us all the time, and I don't know if we value that <laughs> and realize that, but there's something so beautiful that when we're gathered together because we are praising the King of Kings that he comes. So football season is starting. The Jets... Wow, I can't believe I'm talking about the Jets. Got a new quarterback. See, I don't even hear a lot of people because there's probably not a lot of Jets fans. <laughs> but I can tell you right now, when they play tomorrow and that new quarterback comes on the field, <laughs> that stadium is going to be roaring and amazing because they're like, we could actually maybe win this year. And they're going to be going crazy and wild, really, over some dude and the potential to win. And so I think about us as the kingdom of God and God's people, when we're gathered together, there is something different and powerful because we're not rooting for just some man playing football, throwing a ball, even though I will be rooting for the giants though, right? But we're rooting for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when we gather, amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Larry, thank you. We're gathering as God's people. We're his church. So when we're talking about life groups, when we're talking about the moms group that, that we're having, when we're talking about this Friday, these are chances and opportunities that we have as God's people to gather together. Because when we are gathered together in God's name, he will be with us. And when he's with us, he will strengthen us. He will empower us. So whether it's this Friday, whether it's that mom's group, whether it's any life group, may it be in this next season of your life that you tell yourself, that you tell your family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to follow the Lord and we're going to gather together as much as we can. We're not going to give the world and all that it offers more than we give God and his people. And when we do that, God says this promise, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I'll come and heal my land. God wants to come, but it's got to start in our houses. It's got to start in our church. And when we do that, God will move in mighty ways. Amen. Amen. 
if you don't sign up after that, I, I, I don't know what's wrong. Amen. 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 Thank God for a wonderful wife and and thank you. Yeah, yeah, Kevin, I needed a wife too, so the Lord could send me forth effectively. Amen. 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 Well, it's my privilege this morning to share with you a message that goes along with the theme that you heard from the Thompsons, and that is not willing that anyone should perish. Not willing. I am so thankful for a church in which missions is emphasized. You know, that, that vision of missions it's not just a personal flavor or preference of our pastor and his wife, our lead pastor and his wife. It is the heart of God. I'm thankful that Pastor and Sister B have lived it and give to it and preach it and emphasize it. I am. Thank God for that. Thank you for giving and believing and clapping and supporting our missionaries. But I want you to know it's not just the flavor of Calvary Assembly at Springfield. It is the very heart of our God. Our God says, I am not willing that anyone should perish. And the Holy Spirit led me to this message this morning to share with you, and I just pray that just for the next little while or so, before we close in prayers, I share God's word that your heart would be open. Though our heads know this truth, may it sink down the 18 inches into our heart and make that change that we would declare along with God, I am not willing that anyone should perish. So as we prepare to hear God's word, would you pray with me? Lord, we open up our hearts to you. Lord, certainly our physical ears need to be opened. Our minds need to be listening and attentive. We need to lean in. But Lord, on a far deeper and even more effective level, would you let our souls and spirits come alive and lean into you, letting our spiritual ears be open and ready to receive what you have for us. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. When you and I consider the amount of people in this world, it can be at the same time deceivingly, um, the, the numbers can be deceiving, but at the same time when we consider them, they can be just so huge and overwhelming. It was about 60 years ago in 1960 that the world population was 3 billion people. But it's been growing ever since. We're currently at the rate of 385,000 babies being born every day around the world. And so now, just over 60 years later, since 1960, the current world population sits at about 8 billion people. 8 billion is 8,000 million. The numbers are just overwhelming. You say, Pastor Josh, 8 billion, I just can't fathom what that means. Let's, let's bring it down local to where we live. All right, let's talk about our tiny little state of New Jersey. In our tiny little state of New Jersey, our population is about 9 million people. Now, for the illustration, stay with me now. Let's say we lined up those 9 million people that live in our little state of New Jersey, and then you said, I'm going to greet each one of those people just for five seconds. Just walk down the line. I'm just going to say, hello, how are you? What's your name? Nice to meet you. Hello, how are you? What's your name? Nice to meet you. Hello, nice to meet you. What's your name? Thank you. Five seconds a person. Let's say you walk down that line of just the population of New Jersey for just five seconds a person, and you did this all day and all night and all tomorrow and all the next night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week without stopping, just five seconds a person, how long do you think it would take you to greet just the population of New, New Jersey? You're like, oh, I don't know, a week or two, maybe till the end of September. I crunched the numbers. It would take you from now, 24-7, five seconds a person, until February of 2025. There are so many people out there. Whether you drive down the parkway or fight the traffic on Route 22 or visit the mall, it becomes a blur. They all kind of blend in. We're just fighting to get through and make our way through. But what if we could see them one by one? You're back standing at that line of nine million people and God is standing behind you, let's imagine, you know what? God would be whispering in your ear as you walk down that line and ask for each person's name. God would be saying about each person, not that one, not that one, not that one. 
God, what do you mean not that one? God would say about this. He would say, I don't want that one to perish. I don't want that one to perish. Oh, no, I never destined that one to go to eternity without me. Not that one or that one or that one. And we would stop and say, Lord, you do realize you're saying that about every single person on the line. He says, I know. I am not willing that any one should perish. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is patient toward you, not willing that any one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire for every life starting at conception and it hasn't changed is this, oh, that they would turn to me and be saved. It's not my will that any should be lost. All right, Lord, I, I've considered the population of the world in New Jersey, but Lord, how about just the people that I come in contact with every day? Even those ones? Even my crazy Uncle Bob? E even the guy in traffic with the tinted windows and the loud music who cut me off in traffic? E even that person, even the person who sits next to me at college, and I look, whoa, whoa, I don't know what, who they are or what they're thinking, but even those ones? Yes, each one. The Apostle Paul knew all about the people of this crazy world. The Bible tells us he had gone to preach in the city of Ephesus in his missionary journeys, and everyone knew about the city of Ephesus, for it, was, it contained one of the wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis. Artemis, the great goddess, the, the daughter of Zeus, the goddess of fertility. The inscription in that city read, Artemis is the goddess of our great city. And he went and had the audacity, the Paul did, to preach Jesus and that Jesus is the only way. <laughs> and idols cannot bring us any closer to peace, forgiveness, or heaven. Well, the people of Ephesus didn't like that too much, at least some of them. And some of them went to the town square and started ch chanting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the Bible tells us in Acts 19 that they chanted that. The whole city was in an uproar and chanted that for two hours straight. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Paul's friends wouldn't even let him go in. They said, you're going to get killed if you go in there. It was in that craziness where after Paul left, he appointed some years later Timothy to be the pastor at Ephesus. And Paul wrote to Timothy as the pastor of the church in that crazy city with people who would chant the name of Artemis for two hours. He said, here's what I want you to believe, Timothy, and I want you to preach to your congregation there in Ephesus. 1 Timothy 2. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved. The, the people who chant for two hours straight and they are so lost, you think they'll never be saved. He wants them to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, every single one. This is our Lord's heart. You and I should be walking through our day echoing God's heart saying, not that one, Lord, not that one. You didn't destine that one to be saved. It's not too late for that one as long as they have a breath in their body, one second left in their life. I know we know this, church, but oh, how then can it get in our heart like it is in God's heart? How can we get on board with Him? We can ask this question, what truths do we need to grasp so that God's heart becomes our heart? Three simple things I want to share with you this morning. If you could grab a hold of these truths and then at the end of the sermon, pray them with me. I believe we are that much closer to having God's heart. First is this. We must grab a hold of this truth. Each one of those people that you know, the nine million in that line of New Jersey, the ones in Africa, the ones around the world, each one is precious to God. We must grab a hold of this foundational truth. Every single individual is utterly precious to God. David wrote a prayer to God that represents the life of every human. He said this in Psalm 139. You created my innermost parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. And Lord, how precious are your thoughts for me. How vast is the sum of them. Just God's thoughts, his heart, his intent when he looks at every single person individually. Nature is beautiful. It speaks of the glory of God, the mountains, the sky, the sea, our universe. Animals and creatures, they're 
majestic when we consider how they have been crafted by God. But only about humans does God say they are precious to me. Only about humans does God say they are of immeasurable value to me. And as we look at this verse, it says when he thinks about them, he doesn't just say humans, they're neat or they're cool or they're unique, but he says they are precious to me. You see, when we look at our crazy Uncle Bob or that crazy person sitting next to us in college, we probably don't have very many precious thoughts about them. Let's be honest. We're like, they're sinners. They're lost. The, the better I can do to more effectively avoid them and stay out of their way and them out of my way, the happier life I'll have. But the Bible tells us in Romans 5, God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God said, in effect, here is how precious you are to me. I will give my son to die for you. The Bible tells us that as Jesus hung on the cross, he wasn't the only one hanging on the cross that day. To his left and to his right, there were two criminals, hardened, rebellious, bad criminals, truly worthy of death because of their crimes. And they hung there also on crosses. And in the process of Jesus hanging there, the Bible tells us that one of those criminals started to say, I deserve to die. My crimes have put me here. No excuses, but this man, Jesus, he is perfect. He doesn't deserve to die. And then he looked at Jesus, the criminal did, and he said, Jesus, I have a crazy question for you. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus... I know you got a lot going on right now. I know you're pulling yourself up on the cross to catch your breath so you won't suffocate. I know you have been beaten to a pulp so badly that your face is so disfigured you're not even recognizable. I know you've got the whole world to think about, Jesus. But Jesus, I know it's too much to ask, but could you remember me, just me, individually? And Jesus looked at him and said, you're crazy. I got too much. No, he didn't. He said, I'll remember you. That's why I'm here. In fact, I, Jesus said, you, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I'm hanging here for you. You, Mr. Criminal, you, sinner, are precious to me. We say that we need to love the world as God loves the world, but I want to just share this principle with you. True love always starts with value and honor. Unless we value people as made in the image of God, precious to God, unless we value them and say they're even worthy of our love, we'll never take the step to demonstrate our love to them. It must start with this. Lord, let me value people as you do. When our thoughts are despising about people, hateful, God forbid, discriminatory, or, or stereotypical, when we downgrade people, there is no way we're ever going to love them or show them the love of Jesus. May all of us as God's people be raised to the place where we view people as precious, valuable, honorable as God does. We must say that one is precious and loved by God. That one is valuable. That one is worth Jesus dying for. And so, that one is precious to me. That one I will die for if God calls me true. Will we see people as precious to God? If we do, then grab a hold of this second powerful truth. Each one has an eternal soul. We walk down that line of nine million and it's easy to judge people by their outward needs. Oh man, that person, boy, he needs a haircut. We get near to the next one. Woo, okay, a little B.O. there. You need a bath. The next one, oh man, have you been eating right? You look a little hungry. Next one, no needs that I can see. They look rich and, and pretty good, no needs. But each one, whether poor or rich, whether good looking on the outside or maybe not so much, has a common foundational need, and that is this, that they have an eternal soul. Lord, help us to grasp this that every single person we drive past on the parkway, we meet at work, we talk on the phone to or text or email, has a soul that will continue into eternity forever and ever and ever and ever and ever with no end. 
Hebrews 9 says, people are appointed to die once, and then they stand before God's judgment seat. No second chances after death, no reincarnation. The book of Revelation gives us a picture of what that standing before judgment will be for those who have not received Christ's forgiveness. It's a, it's a hard passage to read. It is. Revelation 20. John said, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, and from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, rich and poor, celebrities and unknowns, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened. It was called the Book of Life. And any one who was not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire where the worm does not die, where people and their souls endure forever. Every person, this passage tells us, is in one of two categories. Their name is either in God's book of life or it's not. There's no other books. Well, you didn't make it to God's book of life, but you can ride into eternity economy class. Oh, you, you can ride with the luggage, but you can get to heaven. Some, no, they're in or they're not, heaven or hell forever. And if we can just, tomorrow morning as we wake up and get ready and brush our teeth and get dressed and head out of the house, stop at the doorway and say, Lord, let me see people as eternal souls, it'll change who we are and who that person is in our eyes. Not as rich or poor or celebrities or that person's annoying or that person, no, eternal lies. If you say, I have trouble doing that, then maybe you might need to do what I have to do sometimes, and that's go to the HSO, Holy Spirit Optometry Office. Get with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, here I am in your chair. Boy, this room's kind of dim. Holy Spirit, um, I need my spiritual eyesight examined. Holy Spirit says, what's the problem? Well, Lord, my eyesight's getting a little blurry. When I look at people, I just it's a little blurry and fuzzy. I, I don't know if I'm seeing him right. Maybe I am. I thought I was. He says, let me check you out. And he looks inside the eyes of our heart. And he says, oh, I see your problem. You suffer from nearsightedness. You only see them in terms of this life. Oh, I need to give you the fix, the salve to put on your eyes, some holy ointment, so you can see people with a farsighted vision. You can see them past this temporal life and see them as eternal souls. If you go to the Holy Spirit as often as you need to, you don't have to make an appointment. You can just walk right in. He says, I'll see you now. Come. Do it on your way out of the house tomorrow morning. Holy Spirit, just wash my eyes. Let me see people as precious, as eternal souls. And finally, let me see each one as one who needs to hear the message. It is so vital that we hold on to the truth that every soul is precious and eternal, but we've got to take it to point three. We've got to open up our Bibles like Kevin did and read Matthew 28 and say, that means me. Romans 10 says this, how can they, every single person, believe in him if they've never heard about him? Paul is just doing some basic common sense reasoning here. Lord, I want the world to be saved now I'm just going to stay home in my, in my easy chair. He says, oh, no, no. How can they hear about Jesus if, unless someone tells them? Did this scenario ever happen to you? You're texting someone and, and you, you type a text message to them expecting a reply and they never reply to you. And you're like, I don't know what just happened. They're ghosting me. What's happening? And a couple of days go by and you, you happen to see them in church or somewhere and you're like, hey, why didn't you ever reply to my text message? And they look at you like, huh? You're like, yeah, I sent it to you. Here, I'll show you. You pull out your phone and you're scrolling through and you get to that message and you go, uh -huh. I typed it, but I never pushed send. Oh, I typed it. I thought I had sent it, but I, but I hadn't. We're all typed out. Oh, yes, I'm believing the world to, to receive Jesus. Yes, oh, oh, man, boy. We never get sent. And we're confused. Why isn't 
people hearing about Jesus? Why aren't they coming to Jesus? And Jesus says, you didn't let me send you. Unless we, those who know Jesus, become the messengers, the message will not get through. This verse was clear about it. Lest we think that somehow God is going to hijack the process, he won't. He has left us here to be the messengers. It's how he designed it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 reaffirms it when it says, God has given us the work of bringing other people back to God. Essentially, we are messengers, simply that. We are not the message. We are not the ones to be given the attention. No, we are messengers for Christ. God is using us to call people. So that's why he's left us here on earth, to stand here for Christ and to beg people, come back to God. We don't need to save people. Oh, that's the Holy Spirit's work. The Father draws, the Spirit regenerates, but we do need to be the messengers. If you and I know God, if He's forgiven us, if our name is found in the book of life, then we're a messenger. The prophet Isaiah found this out in dramatic fashion. He was taken on a visit to God's heavenly throne room, and there as he stood in God's presence, he was so keenly aware of his sins and his shortcomings. And he went, oh, I'm I'm just going to disintegrate in God's presence here. And it says that God there in the throne room cleansed him, cleansed him of his sins. Oh, what joy. And I can just see Isaiah going, this is what joy this is. And he turns to leave like, thanks, God, for cleansing me. And he hears a voice. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah realized that day what we need to know that God doesn't only want to cleanse us, he wants to send us. He doesn't want to just cleanse us and make us holy and get us, we're all spit-shined and we're all looking nice and we're like, all right, Jesus, you can return now. I'm all ready. No, he says, I've cleansed you to send you. Those are our two purposes. Anytime we come near to God, anytime you spend time with him in your devotions, anytime, Lord, I'm here, cleanse me. Oh, Lord, make me like you. Now, Lord, what's your purpose is for me today? Send me out. You might say, like Kevin did this morning, I don't, I don't know if I have the education. I haven't gone here. I haven't gone to Bible college. I'm not ready. Just hear the call. Let him send you, even to just one. As I close this morning, as Justin comes to the piano. Thank you, Justin. I want to tell you a true story that a pastor friend of mine shared with me. I believe it will encourage you this morning. It was March of 1973. The place was Porto Alegre in Brazil. And missionary Bernard Johnson was holding a series of evangelistic outreach services there in Brazil. On the first night of his services, a 19-year-old young woman named Maria received Jesus. She committed her life to Jesus. She went forward. She said, Jesus, forgive me. I believe you've died and rose again for me. She committed her life to him. She was so excited in this new life in Christ. She went back the second night, and there on the second night of the services, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. She was just so excited, so excited. Well, that Sunday, she... She found a Bible-believing church. It was some distance from her house, but she traveled there, attended the church. And during the pastor's message, he said this. He said, if you believe in Jesus, have you yet witnessed to someone? And she she was touched by the Holy Spirit. She said, I haven't yet told anyone about what God did for me, what Jesus did for me. And right there at the end of the service, she made a promise. She said, God, I will not go to bed tonight until I share the message of Jesus with someone. I don't know who, but someone. She left church and she got on the bus for the 40-minute drive back to her apartment, just expecting that God would put this person next to her on the bus, but nobody sat next to her on the bus. She had no opportunities. She got off and she's walking home from the bus stop to her apartment, just feeling like she failed God. She walked into her apartment that evening, and as she walked in, she felt the Holy Spirit prompt her heart to go to the telephone. So she walked to the telephone in her apartment. She said, what next? God said, open up the city phone book. So she pulled out the old city phone book there and plopped it on the desk. Who do I call? God said, open it up and point. 
So she said, all right, I know this isn't me. So she closed her eyes and opened up the phone book and plopped her finger down on the page. And her finger went on the name Johnny Sousa. It was a number. She picked up the phone and dialed the number. It rang once, two, three, five times. Finally, on the sixth ring, a gruff voice answered and said, who is this? And Maria froze. She hadn't planned what to say. And so all she could think of was the song that they sang at the services she had been to that past week, which we know in English as, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. So she sang it. Halfway through her song, the gruff voice changed, and the man on the other end of the line said, Don't hang up, please. Please, I want to go get my wife so she can hear this too. A minute later, he came back and he said, Now, me and my wife, Clara, are standing by the phone. C could you sing that song again, please? She sang it again. He said, could you sing it a second time? She sang it a second time. He said, a third time, please. She sang it three times, and then she said, here's why I called, because I want you to know that I have new life in Jesus. She told them her testimony, and she explained how they could receive Jesus as well. And they said, we'd like to receive that forgiveness in Christ. She prayed with them over the phone. What joy that she could share with someone who needed to receive Jesus. She was about to say goodbye when Johnny said to her, could I tell you our story? She said, sure. He said, me and my wife Clara have been married for seven years. But it's kind of been a sad seven years because we've been so desperately trying to have a child, but we can't have one medically. So we thought we might adopt, but we didn't have enough money to adopt, and so to make matters worse, six months ago, he said, I lost my job, and we are now down to our last few dollars, and we're going to be evicted from our apartment tomorrow. He said, so this morning, he said, I went to the store, and I bought some poison, and I took it home, and me and my wife both agreed that we would die together. Life wasn't worth living anymore. He said, I put it in some cups. I mixed it. He said, and we took the cups and together raised the glasses to our lips and the phone started to ring. He said, we, we looked at each other like, we'll just wait for the person to, to give up and hang up. He said, but it kept ringing. So just to make the phone stop, he said, we put down our glasses and I answered the phone. God arranges our circumstances God goes ahead of us. God knows that the harvest fields are ready. Oh, and God has a plan because that's not even the end of the story. As wonderful as it is, Johnny Sousa, God called him into ministry. And he started an Assembly of God church. And that church in Brazil grew to 30,000 members with people lining the altars getting saved month after month, week after week, because one 19-year-old said, I am a messenger. As we close this morning, I want you to put up that final slide for me. And I'm going to ask you to do something interesting. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to keep your eyes open during our prayer time. Now, if you say, I just can't do that, then you can close your eyes if you want. But I'm going to pray, and we're going to lift up our voices to God and pray these three things. If your hearts have been touched this morning, would you pray these three things with me? Jesus, we pray together that you would help us value people as precious. Lord, we lift our eyes to you. Lord, we, we are so quick to judge people based on how they look or how they act. Oh God, we pray. We lift our hearts and eyes to the heavens asking you, Lord, that we would see people as precious. Lord, we would value them as you value them. Jesus, look, look at the second point. Jesus, give us your eyes that see people as eternal souls. Lord, give us your eyes that don't see people based on this world or what they have or don't have but that they are people of eternity. Lord, we pray together, give us your eyes. And finally, Lord, we commit to be your messengers. Oh, Lord, we do. If you want to bow right now with me as I just pray and close. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would have the boldness, Lord, of Maria. Lord, we would have the understanding that there is nothing we can do ever to draw someone, to convince them, to work out circumstances. Lord, but you can. 
Lord, as you give us the opportunity, as you give us the boldness, as you fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, we will go. We will believe in our missionaries who have given their lives to go. We will give. We will pray. Lord, we will take up that great commission and not let, Lord, the salvation that we have received stay with us. Lord, we even ask your forgiveness this morning for the opportunities or the years that we have squandered and wasted. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Lord, thank you that you are patient with us not wanting anyone to perish. Lord, we believe that's why you are even delaying and waiting to return. Lord, because you want your message to go out in every corner of this globe, every corner of New Jersey, every place, every place where you have sent us, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Lord, this is our prayer. God, I pray that by faith, Lord, we would obey. By faith, we would step out. By faith, we would take a chance this week and open our mouths and share with someone the good news, even if it's as simple as just asking them if they want to, to be prayed for or come to church with us or asking them about their needs. Lord, give us that boldness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, as we close this morning, we thank you that your salvation is not limited to us, but it is available to each one. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, thank you for being so patient with us. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we just linger in your presence just a, just a moment longer. Yes, Lord. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do the work in us. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, I, I so rarely do this that I'm even hesitant to do it now, but I believe there's someone here this morning that God is, might be calling to full-time ministry and you, has, you have, av, as, as of yet, not said yes to him. If this is for you, if God has called you to full-time ministry as, as a minister for him, as a missionary for him, I want you to know that God says, that's not your imagination, that is my call. If that message was for you, just take that this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, send us forth, Lord, with, with rejoicing and peace. Lord, help us not to walk into our colleges and workplaces and neighborhoods, Lord, with a sense of, of guilt, oh God, or, or a condemnation, oh God. No, Lord, with a sense of joy. Lord, that we have a message that the world so desperately needs. Oh, Lord, we lift up this cup of salvation. We call on your name. Use us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Don't leave this morning without stopping by the missionary table, talking to Kevin and Mariah, um, and asking them a question. If you have one, picking up a prayer card. God bless you. Thank you for coming this morning.